This week we're going to go over some of the classic experimental designs developed by R.A. Fisher and then talk about some newer approaches that are specific to natural resource science. As we've talked about, you always start with your scientific question or hypothesis and develop your experimental approach based on the question that you're asking. Just so that we're all clear on some terminology, just want to briefly review the uh, ways of uh, describing different variables in an experiment. The dependent or response variable is the output that you're interested in measuring and understanding. So, so things like fish growth rate, invertebrate survival, bird density, whatever it might be. Your independent or predictor variables are the variables that are either manipulated or measured uh, that we expect may influence the dependent variable. So these are often part of the uh, hypothesis as well. So things like food type, heavy metal concentration, uh, forest thinning, all of those uh, factors that could influence the abundance, density, survival of whatever group you're interested in. Milliken and Johnson in their 1984 book, Analysis of Messy Data, uh, described three different parts to experimental design, design structure, treatment structure, and method of randomization. Design structure uh, refers to how the plots are arranged, what kinds of measurements are taken, and so on. Treatment structure are the actual treatment types and levels that are applied. So if we're looking at heavy metal concentrations, what levels of heavy metal are you going to use in your aquaria when you're studying the effects on invertebrate survival, for instance. And finally, method of randomization uh, is how the treatments are assigned to the plots, units, individuals, subunits, and so on. And that really dictates the type of experiment that you're developing. And once you have developed your experimental design, that design almost always dictates the statistical analysis that should be used to analyze those data. Let's review some of the statistical assumptions. I'm assuming that you've gotten this in your elementary stats course, so we'll keep it brief. Some of the assumptions of the approaches that we'll be talking about here. Number one, normal distribution. The F-test uh, is generally robust to non-normality of data, but if you have uh, flat or peaked distributions, they generally by themselves uh, don't have a, that much of an effect on your alpha, but um, if the sample size is small or sample sizes differ greatly between the different groups, then those kinds of deviations from normal can be a problem. Secondly, um, as we've talked about, you need a random sample in order to make the correct st statistical inference from your uh, sample to your population. Uh, third, we assume that errors are independent. In other words, that the deviation of a observation from its group mean uh, is independent of all the other deviations. And where you can get into trouble with this is if you have pseudo replication. In other words, you really only have one experimental unit, but you're measuring it several times, in which case your errors will often be uh, smaller than you would expect from completely independent uh, samples. And finally, homogeneity of variances. And here we assume that the variance is associated with each group in your uh, statistical design are equal. Um, <clears throat> so again, the deviation of those observations from their group means are similar in the different groups. And again, the F-test is generally uh, robust to moderate violations of uh, homogeneity of variances. But if you have unequal sample sizes, this can become a problem. And then your F-test, uh, in many cases, will be wrong. The simplest experimental design is a completely randomized design. And as the name implies, Treatments are randomly assigned to the experimental units. 
Ideally, the manipulation is controlled, but this is not possible in many ecological studies. A uh, couple of examples, say you're interested in the efficacy of an insecticide and in reducing flea numbers at uh, black-tailed prairie dog towns. This would be a manipulative experiment. You might choose four prairie dog towns uh, out of a random, uh, out of a population of prairie dog towns that you're interested in and assign two to be treatment sites where insecticide is applied and two to be controlled where maybe you walk through it and you spread talcum powder or something. Um, you wanna do everything similar to the site where you apply the insecticide, but uh, just not use that insecticide, use a, a non-lethal control substance. An example of a non-manipulative uh, experiment in this kind of uh, in a completely randomized design is say you have a watershed where you have um, streams that have no heavy metal present moderate levels of heavy heavy metal and high levels of heavy metal and you want to see how that influences um, coronamid numbers at sites so in that case, you would identify all the streams uh, as to which category they were in, low, moderate, or high heavy metals. Randomly select from those streams for your sampling, and then go out and measure the abundance of the coronamids. Uh, so no manipulation going on there, but certainly an appropriate way to address that question. And another way you might look at the coronamid question is to bring it into the lab and study the effects of heavy metals in the lab. So in this case, say we went out to a number of different rivers and collected coronamid larvae and randomly assigned them to different levels of copper concentration from no copper to 10 parts per million to 100 parts per million. And again, you'd have replicates of each one of those. You would wanna make sure everything else was done similarly in those beakers, and then you could look at survival of those coronamids over time. Data from an experiment like this would be analyzed either using a t-test if there's only two groups, or ANOVA if there's multiple groups. One drawback of the completely randomized design is that if there's a lot of variation among your experimental units, it may be difficult to detect an effect. This is especially true in environmental studies where we know that uh, spatial and temporal variation is often high and sometimes there may be genetic differences among your uh, samples that could also have an influence. And again, just a review here of what we're doing with a F-test for these kinds of data. Um, you collect your measurements on your different groups. And in this case, maybe it's survival of your coronamids. And you take the mean associated with each group, and that would be your treatment means indicated by treatment one, two, and three here. And those are measured as a deviation from the grand mean. Um, and on the equation below, you can see that the outcome for each observation can be listed as the grand mean plus a treatment effect plus a residual error for that particular observation. And this is what we mean when we talk about additive models, that you can reproduce the data uh, by adding together the uh, means and the error terms. And for the F-test, basically what you're looking at is, is the variation among the treatment means greater than the variation within the groups? In other words, if you have a lot of variation among your treatment means, that indicates there's some sort of strong effect there. And if that variation is much greater than the variation within those groups, then it's indicating that the uh, treatment that you are measuring has a important effect on the response variable. The next type of experimental design is the randomized complete block design, 
this also includes what we call paired designs, where you pair or block experimental units and then randomly assign treatments. So in a paired design, an example might be, uh, again, this uh, applying insecticides um, to prairie dog colonies. If you're setting this up as a paired design, what you could do is divide each site in half and randomly assign the treatment and control to each half. So in this case, you're using each prairie dog town as its own control. So if there's a lot of variation in flea densities among the prairie dog towns, this would control for that because you'd be just comparing um, each half to its um, paired uh, other half. This is also done oftentimes in medical studies where you uh, match in the treatment and control groups by sex, age, weight, and so on to, again, reduce the variation in the experimental units prior to the application of the treatment, giving you a better test of the treatment effect. For blocked, this is where um, the randomized complete block design really started was in uh, agricultural studies. We knew that there was a lot of variation in the fertility of soils from one farm to another. So if you're looking at trying to test how well wheat variety A versus B versus C grew in a region, you wouldn't want to just grow them all at different farms because there'd be a lot of variation in soil that would um, affect your response variable. So what you do is you go to one farm and you plant all three varieties there. Go to another farm, do the same thing. This is the figure that I have to the right here. Again, you're um, assigning the treatments randomly on each farm, but now again, you're comparing your um, growth uh, between the treatments at the same farm to control for that effect of, uh, of the farm, essentially. Another example, again, with the coronamids is if you know that there might be variation in their ability to withstand various levels of heavy metals from one river to another, then again, blocking on river could be an important uh, approach to reducing variation. So um, as we talked about, one of the reasons for doing the completely um, randomized block design is because it can be more efficient and will reduce sources of variation. Uh, over the completely randomized design. So if we look at the uh, example of the effects of copper on coronamids, so instead of now just going out and collecting your coronamids and randomly assigning them to the heavy metal treatments, now you would block on river. So all those coronamids that were collected from the Colorado, you would assign the three different treatments to them, uh, Arkansas, Poudre, and so on. Same sort of setup uh, <clears throat> that we had before, but now you'd need more beakers because you would have to have replicates within each block and within each treatment. Um, why might uh, blocking reduce variation? Well, we know that uh, these invertebrates have been exposed to these heavy metals in these rivers for well over 100 years. The heavy metals um, were increased in these rivers by mining back in the 1800s. And many of these rivers have had high levels of heavy metals ever since then, although we're working on um, getting that out of many of those rivers. Uh, but in the meantime, many of these invertebrates have developed uh, uh, genetic changes that make them less susceptible to toxic levels of heavy metals or what would be toxic in populations that have not been exposed. So if you hadn't controlled for that, you may have some individuals that are very resistant to heavy metals, uh, others that are not. And if you just throw those all together into your beakers to look at your heavy metal effect, uh, that may create so much variation that uh, you wouldn't be able to see any strong effect of the heavy metals themselves. And coming back to our graphical representation now, again, the additive model um, is used here. 
Now we have an additional variable and that is the block effect. So here I've just shown two of the groups that uh, might be used in this experiment. Uh, there would be many others that have not been shown here just for clarity. And now in order to get your overall um, group mean, you would add the block effect and the treatment effect and then look at your um, deviation from that uh, overall mean to, uh, would be your residual error. So your equation would be grand mean plus the block effect plus the treatment effect plus the residual error. You could add what we call an interaction term uh, if you have replicates of treatments within each block. And generally that is not done. You just have one a replicate of a treatment in each block, but you certainly could add it. And generally in this situation, the block effect is not the variable of interest. It could be if you're asking, you know, is there a difference in, vari in survival of coronamids from one river to another, for instance, but really you're trying to factor out the block effect so you can have a better understanding of the treatment effect. And another thing to point out here is if there is a lot of variation associated with your uh, different rivers, you can often get by with uh, many fewer replicates when you block on river in this case, because now you only need one replicate uh, of each river copper concentration combination. Uh, in this case, we're putting 10 coronamids in each beaker, so we can look at how many survive over a certain period of time. But now we uh, only have uh, nine different beakers versus 30 in the uh, previous example. And presumably the reason we can get away with this is that we're factoring out this high source of variation uh, associated with river to river uh, variation. So now let's look at another class of experimental designs, and those are what are known as factorial designs. And these are very, very important in ecological and natural resource studies, as we'll talk about. In this case, you're looking at two or more categorical variables uh, being examined simultaneously in an experiment. So let's go over some terminology. A factor refers to a categorical uh, independent variable that you want to examine and look at how it affects your dependent variable. So <clears throat> treatment factors would refer to uh, factors that can be manipulated. So levels of pesticide, heavy metals, temperature, and so on. Something that you can control and you can um, look at various different uh, quantitative levels of that particular factor. Classification factors are fixed factors that cannot be manipulated by the experimenter. So things like location, and the example we gave was river, sex, age, uh, and so on. Those are things that uh, cannot be manipulated by the experimenter. In other words, you can't uh, manipulate the level of sex um, or the level of location, for instance. And the level refers to the particular value of a factor. So the different concentra concentrations of copper, for instance, that were used in the previous example, if you use different temperatures, exactly what those temperatures are, insecticide concentration and so on. Uh, classification factors, again, would just refer to the particular rivers, habitat types, ages, sexes, and so on that were used in the experiment that you performed. Factorial designs are described by the number of factors and the number of levels within each factor in the experiment. So for instance, a two by two factorial would refer to two factors, maybe temperature and heavy metal concentration, and two levels of each factor. A four by three by two factorial indicates that there are three different factors in the experiment, four levels of factor one, three levels of factor two, and two levels of factor three. 
A complete factorial is a experiment where all possible combinations are included. In other words, you run uh, experimental units including all of the combinations of the different factors. And randomization, again, must occur at all levels. In this case, um, we have a new um, term in our uh, equation describing the factorial design. So we have our grand mean again, factor one effect, factor two effect, and now we can look at what we call the interaction effect, the interaction between factor one and factor two, and of course, the residual error. What we mean by an interaction effect is the effect of one factor depends on the level of another factor. Another way of thinking about this is it's a synergistic effect. In other words, the effect of a factor is greater uh, depending on the level, greater or less, depending on the level of the other factor alone. And one way you can think about this is stress in uh, organisms. So for instance, as temperature increases, as you can see from the left-hand graph here, the survival of the coronamids decreases from two degrees up to 10 degrees C. And that's what you'd expect. Also, we'd expect that survival declines with increasing levels of uh, heavy metals. But what we're seeing with an interaction effect is rather than those effects being simply additive based on the levels of each factor alone, now we're saying that the effect of temperature, for instance, becomes greater at higher levels of copper. And the, a good way of displaying this graphically is by looking at the uh, lines, the relationship between each factor using a uh, graph like this. So you can see that at two degrees C, the effect of increasing copper concentrations has less of an effect on survival than it does at 10 degrees C. So this would be an indication of a interaction effect, that the effect of copper depends on the temperature at which the uh, animals are being uh, maintained. Another important distinction is the difference between random and fixed effects. Random effects are factors that are randomly selected from a population to which we're making inference. So if we're looking at different ways of estimating salamander numbers in ponds in Nebraska, uh, ponds would be the random effect. Maybe we have three different techniques that we're using for estimating abundance visual surveys versus mark recapture versus uh, some other approach, line transects perhaps. Uh, we're really not interested in the ponds themselves. We just want to essentially control for pond to pond variation. Um, and if we were to do the survey again, we would uh, randomly select a whole set of different ponds. So that's one way to think about a random effect is that uh, the particular <coughs> Um, pond in this case would not necessarily be included in a subsequent um, experiment. Another example is like sixth grade science teachers in Illinois. And again, maybe we're looking at different ways of teaching science to a class. And again, we want to control for that teacher to teacher variation, but we're really not interested in testing whether teacher A differs from teacher B. We just want to be able to make generalizations to all sixth grade science teachers. A fixed effect um, is where factor levels are, as the name implies, fixed and would be the same if the experiment was repeated. So some of the things we've reviewed, age, sex, habitat type, specific levels of pesticide or heavy metal. So again, that's a good way of distinguishing between these two types of factors. And finally, uh, another important distinction are the types of designs, whether they're balanced, unbalanced, or uh, complete or incomplete. So a balanced factorial design means that there's equal numbers of observations for all combinations of factor levels. 
and that is the best situation. The uh, analysis of the data is very straightforward. Unbalanced is when there's unequal numbers of observations per level, and you have to use fitted means. You want to make sure you're using uh, good statistical software, anything like SAS, SPSS, R, can easily handle unequal sample sizes. Um, and the third type is what we call an incomplete block design, when not all of the treat treatment combinations occur, maybe because of funding limitations, space, logistics, and so on. When you get to this kind of a design, the analysis becomes tricky, inferences is not as straightforward, it's really good to have a good statistician involved, uh, especially at the start to make sure that the combinations of uh, factor levels that you are including are the appropriate ones so that you can really test uh, the hypothesis that you want to test. So just a quick review of what this might look like. Um, if we're looking at our copper and temperature effects, again, on coronamids, two factors, um, a three by four factorial, three levels of temperature, four levels of copper concentration. Um, X is the number of replicates per combination, so we have a nice, balanced, complete design in this example. Here, we see that the number of replicates per combination now differs from cell to cell, and in this case it would be unbalanced but complete. And finally we have an example here of an unbalanced and incomplete design where the numbers differ from one combination to another and there are some combinations that have no replicates. And as I mentioned, analysis can be challenging in this point and you really want to make sure that you have talked to a good statistician before you undertake a unbalanced, incomplete design like this. A very specialized type of design which can be used in certain situations is what's known as the Latin square design. It's very efficient in that the number of observations needed can be many times less than, say, a factorial design but it has a very stringent restriction and that is all factors must have equal level numbers of levels so for example if we add ph uh, to our coronamid uh, experiment in a latin square we'd have three levels of temperature three levels of ph and three levels of uh, copper concentration and they would all have to be arranged very carefully in a uh, arrangement like this so that uh, for each level of pH you have each level of temperature and each level of uh, copper concentration represented. You can see a completely randomized design would require 27 different combinations, um, completely randomized factorial design. Uh, but a Latin square only requires nine, although um, that likely is not going to give you enough replicates to really test the, the effects you're interested in. So as we mentioned, the Latin square design is more efficient um, than the completely random or the randomized complete block or factorial designs. It can isolate nuisance variables, say temperature and pH in our example, the dis disadvantage, of course, is that you have to have equal numbers of levels in each factor. So it has can only be three by three, four by four, five by five, and so on. Um, designs less than five by five generally are not practical because the small number of degrees of freedom, which you need to test the effect that you're interested in. Um, so if we go back to the, the three by three, um, we would probably have to have replications within each cell so that then starts to increase the number of uh, replicates that we're talking about or, or total experimental units. We're also making the very stringent assumption that there are no interactions among the cells and of course as we've talked about in biological systems that can be a very restrictive assumption um, and randomization can get complex as you get to higher 
uh, numbers of levels. The equation for calculating the uh, outcome would be grand mean plus row effect plus column effect plus treatment effect. So um, generally you want to, the, the row and column effects would be the, the nuisance variables or the factors that you're not as interested in by themselves and it's the treatment effect. You're basically using this to try to control for the effects of those other factors. Another approach that can be extremely important in the kind of work we do is what's known as analysis of covariance or ANCOVA. And basically what you do in an ANCOVA is you just add continuous variables to the analysis and analo analyze those simultaneously with the categorical variables that might already be included. Continuous variables can be uh, lots of different things. So for time, um, we may be interested in looking at how numbers of uh, some species change from year to year, and year could be used as a continuous variable here. Uh, time of day may have an influence, say, on bird point count, so you might want to include that in your analysis to factor out that effect to get a better comparison of the treatments or the habitat types or whatever you're comparing. Uh, time since perturbation for perturbation kinds of experiments. Um, habitat variables can also be included. Uh, tree cover, shrub cover, pool depth if we're looking at uh, fish and stream, slope, aspect, all of the, anything that can be measured using a some kind of continuous variable, meaning that the values aren't fixed but can vary from um, you know zero to a hundred or zero to infinity in some cases, um, can be included in virtually any of the kinds of um, designs that we've talked about. And you can have multiple continuous variables. You might even want to throw a quadratic term in there if you think that uh, numbers of individuals of uh, a mammal species might peak at some mid-elevation rather than showing a, a the uh, linear relationship. Uh, and here's the example from the textbook that I think illustrates how this can be important in uh, testing hypotheses. Say you're interested in looking at the mortality to birds uh, caused by two different types of uh, turbines, type A and type B. And you're estimating that by counting bird carcasses underneath the turbines. Um, if you simply count the number of carcasses um, and look at those differences, you may be getting a incorrect um, conclusion because maybe there's more birds in the area where turbine A is uh, deployed versus turbine B. So one way to correct for that would be to estimate bird uh, density or maybe use an index of bird observations per turbine. Um, on the ground and include that in your analysis. And you could see in this example that if you hadn't included that, um, that you would conclude that turbine A causes much higher mortality than turbine B because you found more carcasses underneath those. But when you correct for bird density in the two places, uh, you find that bird density was higher in the area where turbine A occurs versus turbine B. So when you remove that source of variation, you find that there really is no difference. That's the adjusted difference there uh, between the two turbines. And now what we're doing with an analysis of covariance is um, we're estimating the slope of uh, the relationship between our response variable in this case, bird carcasses and um, our independent variable, which is bird density. And so rather than simply adding up factor level effects, you include this term uh, beta, which is the slope of the relationship between the response variable and the covariate. So we have grand mean plus treatment effect, that would be the different turbines, plus beta, or the slope between the covariate um, and 
the response variable. You can even include a treatment by covariate interaction, and again, that would indicate that the slope of that relationship might differ um, in this case. And then, of course, the residual error term. So this is basically a way to try to control for some of these extraneous factors that you know could be important in affecting the outcome of your response variable. Uh, but um, you know, there's, there's no easy way to control those using experimental design kinds of approaches. Very commonly used in natural resource analyses. The most complex kinds of analyses are nested or hierarchical designs. Uh, and this is when levels of one treatment are nested within levels of another treatment. Um, this is often represented as level B nested within level A. Um, B parentheses A. I know it seems backwards, right? You would think if B were nested within A, that you would put A outside of the parens and B inside, but that's the way statisticians do it. So uh, that's the way it's always going to be reported in the literature. And nesting is often done um, when there's uh, sample size issues or logistical constraints or simply the application of a particular treatment can um, often has to be done on a large scale in order for um, the treatment to be applied or for it to be economical or whatever. We'll talk about some examples. The advantages of a nested or hierarchical design is that you can account for the effects of uh, nuisance variables and really focus in on the treatment effect that you're interested in. And uh, in this case, you'll need fewer samples. So a classic example would be you're interested in knowing how planting different densities of ponderosa pine seedlings uh, might influence their you know, survival or ability to become established over time. And you want to do this in clear cuts because that will provide the light that the trees need to grow. Um, but if you really wanted to replicate each type of planting across all of these different clear cuts and have enough replicates. You might need 30 or 40 different clear cuts uh, with one um, treatment or one <clears throat> planting uh, level within each one. Another approach, though, is to have many fewer clear cuts and within each clear cut put each level of planting uh, within it Maybe you could even have replicates within a single clear cut. In many cases, it's difficult to get uh, clear cuts approved and um, <clears throat> find the right sites and so on. So using this approach, you can uh, still look at the treatment that you're really interested in, and that is the uh, effect of the different planting types while controlling for this other effect that you know is important. And maybe there's different levels of thinning uh, of that bigger treatment that you might be interested in. And you know, thinning to a certain level versus clear cut versus uh, big tree retention or whatever it might be. So you have these bigger levels that you can't really replicate uh, very much. And the smaller levels are really the ones you're interested in. Disadvantages, um, then if you've got uh, lots of different types of treatments, if you're adding fertilizer or watering or whatever, um, number of experimental units can become prohibitive. Power of certain tests can be um, low because of small numbers of degrees of freedom. Obviously, you're not going to be replicating your tree thinning uh, treatment nearly as much as the other treatments. Um, and the, um, you know, as we've always talked about, if the nesting of treatment levels or assignments of treatment combinations is not random, the interpretation may be ambiguous. And this 
would probably come in most importantly at the uh, scale of the larger factor. So maybe there's only certain places where you can put uh, clear cuts or do these different levels of thinning, then really your inference only applies to those same situations. Maybe there's certain setback from streams or certain elevation range, uh, slope and so on. So just need to consider what, what the real uh, target population is in those sort of situations. There are two types of hierarchical design that are commonly used in natural resource studies. The first is split plot design, and the other is repeated measures design. Split plot design is uh, very much like the example I was talking about, where you have spatially uh, identified large scale treatment plots, and within those you have multiple uh, levels of other treatments. Um, so, <clears throat> For example, say you were looking at method of tree removal, a lot of areas in the Western US uh, agencies are removing uh, pinion juniper in order to establish more sagebrush because sage grouse are in trouble. Uh, and two different approaches to removing the trees were chaining, putting a big chain between two bulldozers and just knocking them over, uh, or uh, hydroaxing basically blasting the trees with water to uh, uproot them and knock them down. Um, but those are expensive. They generally have to be done over large scales in order for this to be uh, efficient and within budget. So generally, we're not able to replicate those treatments uh, in many different places. Uh, say you're interested in uh, the effects of fertilizer on helping establish uh, sagebrush. You could also add in the size of the sage uh, seedlings that you're putting in there and so on. So chaining and hydroaxing are maybe applied uh, randomly to three each of six large main plots and then your fertilizer treatment is applied to smaller plots within each of those main plots. So that's really kind of the most interest in this case is what's what approach is going to give you the most uh, sagebrush reestablishment, but you want to control for these uh, larger factors of how the trees are removed in the first place. And you can see that the results that you get from within each one of these larger plots uh, are not independent. Um, samples, right? Because the soil slope aspect and so on of all of those uh, sub-treatment plots within a particular stand that was uh, chained are probably going to be similar. So the error um, associated with those are going to be more similar to one another than they would from a totally different plot. So you have to analyze these data uh, differently. And again, it's good to get together with a statistician to make sure that you're using the correct error term when you are comparing your um, fertilizer treatment versus your tree removal treatment, for instance. And very quickly then, the advantages are in situations where you know, you, you're applying large treatments and you really can't replicate those uh, over large scales. Uh, so you want to look at this other uh, split pot factor and you can look at it with more precision because there's less variation within each one of those plots. Uh, the disadvantage is that it compromises the testing of the main effect, the different types of tree removal or the different types of uh, tree thinning or whatever it might be. The second type of hierarchical design is uh, repeated measures design. And this occurs when repeated measurements are taking, taken on the same experimental unit over time. And this is done very commonly. We may take blood samples from bighorn sheep that we have in captivity over time to see how uh, their blood uh, variables might respond to some treatment that we've given them. Um, if we analyze each one of those data points as if they were independent, uh, we would be uh, committing what we call pseudo-replication. In other words, we are assuming that each one of those blood samples uh, 
uh, has a independent error associated with it, but we know that values from an individual bighorn sheep, for instance, are probably going to be more similar to each other than samples from other bighorn sheep, and so we have to take that into consideration when we analyze the data. Um, if we don't, generally we will uh, measure less, we will assume that there's less variation in the data than there actually are, and we would have uh, be falsely increasing our chances of detecting a difference. We'd be increasing our type 1 error. Um, <clears throat> Time, uh, as I mentioned, is often a key factor in the experiment that re requires the repeated measures. Common examples in fish and wildlife studies uh, would be testing the effectiveness of drugs or vaccines on animals where samples of blood are drawn at specified periods over time from the same individuals. That's the important thing, that we're collecting these from the same individuals over time. Um, trapping small mammals or measuring fish abundance at the same location over time. Uh, radio telemetry locations. Again, we're measuring variables from the same individual. And if we're looking at whether it be habitat choice or home range size, we know that individuals are going to differ with respect to those. And therefore, we can't assume that each one of those uh, individual data points that we collect are um, independent from one another. Uh, there also can be repeated measures situations uh, where there's no time element, so maybe an herbicide uh, for aphids involves treating shrubs and then counting aphids on the leaves from four different branches. Um, if you don't account for the fact that counts from uh, branches within the same shrub are going to be more similar to each other, then you will commit pseudo-replication in your analysis. Now I want to cover some designs that uh, really strictly apply to the kinds of natural resource studies that we often are involved with. I know this lecture is getting long, um, so if you want to take a break and come back, we you certainly are um, able to do that. I just want to get through all the different designs in this one lecture so that we're all ready to go from here on. Um, classic example of a study design in natural resource studies is what's known as a before-after control impact study, or BACI as it's usually referred to. You measure response variable on a control and impact site before and after treatment. Now, you really have to have replication of control and impact sites. So you have to have at least two controls, at least two impact sites uh, in order to have any uh, degrees of freedom in your analysis. This is where we often get into pseudo replication where people will take uh, various plots within one treated stand and one reference stand and think that that applies to uh, the entire forest. That would be um, an example of pseudo replication and we'll get into this more when we talk about um, control impact studies later in the course. Um, the nice thing about this is that it controls for both temporal and spatial variation uh, and it's important to recognize that it's the interaction term um, that really is the term of interest when making your comparison. So you expect that number of salamanders or whatever it might be that you're interested in may change over time in your even in your reference stands. Maybe there will be less rain, so there will be fewer animals moving around uh, between this year and next year. Um, and so you're going to expect a change even independent of the treatment that you're applying. So if you do your a treatment, say in this case a clear cut, um, and you measure salamander numbers before and after, you're going to probably find a difference, but you want to be sure that that difference is not just due to natural variation. And so you want to compare what you find on the treatment sites to what you see in the reference stand, and that involves looking at the interaction between 
uh, time and treatment. You'd expect that, say, there's a decline on the reference stands, but there's a greater decline on the treatment stands. That would show up in an interaction term. Uh, sometimes there's not the ability to um, identify a reference area uh, before the treatment is applied. So you can uh, only do a before and after comparison. Here you have to assume that there's no temporal variation. And of course, we know in most ecological systems, there's lots of variation from one time to the next. So that is a, um, a much weaker test of the effect of the treatment than if you have uh, controls or reference areas included. And again, sometimes we can only come in after the effect has been uh, implemented and con uh, compare control to impact sites. And here we're assuming no spatial variation. So again, a uh, much weaker test of our uh, hypothesis, but in some cases that's all we have. Another type uh, that's commonly used in natural resource science is what we call a response gradient design, where you measure the response variable at either different distances from uh, impact site or uh, over time from uh, an impact and examine the change in the variable as a function of distance or time. It's generally best to do this, obviously, in small areas with fairly homogeneous environments. If you have patches of different types of forest uh, surrounding, say, your uh, oil derrick, which is the uh, impact that you're measuring, then you're going to get all sorts of variation and abundance of the species you're looking at um, that is not due to the impact itself. Um, and this is often used for identifying buffer distances, for instance, uh, the effects of oil drilling on sage grouse selects, for instance, is a big question out here in the West to look at, you know, at one point away from a oil operation, do you uh, see no change in the abundance of sage grouse that come into a lek, for instance. This uh, figure on the right-hand side of the slide is from a study that was done in Europe looking at the abundance of mammals and birds as a function of distance from infrastructure. This is roads, buildings, uh, oil installations, whatever, to basically look at what, what are the larger landscape level effects of placing these kinds of infrastructure in natural environments. And you can see for birds, the effect might go out uh, one kilometer before you get back to what uh, you'd expect without the infrastructure present. For mammals, you may go out as far as uh, five or six kilometers before you see uh, abundance that is similar to what it would be in a uh, background. So this can be very helpful for trying to identify how much a particular environmental uh, or uh, infrastructure development might have on overall populations of species of interest. So the last uh, design I'll talk about is what's known as the crossover design. This is essentially a repeated measures design such that each experimental unit, in this case it might be plots, it might be individual animals, receives a different treatment during the different time periods. It's used when the number of experimental units is limited. Maybe you're looking at an endangered species in captivity. You don't have many individuals uh, and you want to look at the effect of some um, treatment that you're applying, um, or if a situation like a, a study I was involved with where we were looking at pesticide treatments on birds, we only had a small area where we could do this work, and we had um, plots set up that were treated in one year, and other plots that weren't, and then we switched and uh, crossed over the following year. It's uh, used in situations when the effect size might expect to be small relative to the spatial and individual variation. Um, and the figure here shows what we're talking about where, say, in the first time period, randomly assign the treatment 
to one individual or, or the plots or individuals. Then you need a washout period. It may just be a certain amount of time that allows the effect to uh, dissipate. And then you apply, you switch and apply the uh, treatment to the other individuals and have the first individuals that were treated become the controls. And you're just looking for a consistent response after those treatments in both cases. So let's go over uh, an example question and talk about how these different experimental designs that we've talked about might be applied to addressing this question. So say our question is, do fish in beaver ponds reduce the survival of Rocky Mountain Boreal Toad tadpoles? This is a, a threatened species here in Colorado. Boreal toads have been declining. It looks like it's the chytrid fungus that's causing a lot of problems, but could be that introduced trout uh, are also causing problems for the species and want to know if that's an important factor. So our hypothesis is that uh, tadpole survival in ponds with fish will be lower than ponds without fish. Uh, second would be um, maybe the impact of fish on tadpole survival will be greater at lower elevations, fish are larger, maybe densities are higher, we might expect more predation in that situation. So the explanatory variables uh, in this case, um, the independent or predictor variables would be fish presence absence, the elevation uh, of the ponds, the dependent or response variable is tadpole survival and we might measure that in a variety of different ways. And we know that there's a number of potential confounding uh, factors or confounding variables that could influence tadpole survival. Presence of tiger salamanders could be important because we know that they eat tadpoles. Water quality, uh, water temperature, the aspect or the direction in which the uh, slope faces that the pond is on and so on could all be uh, influential in influencing tadpole survival. So we'd like to try to control for this as much as we could in our experimental design. And there's, as we talked about, lots of different ways of doing this. So let's go through some different approaches. So we could just use a completely randomized design where we go out and identify, uh, look at lots of ponds and find those with and without fish and randomly choose equal numbers uh, from those populations and measure tadpole survival. The advantage is that it's simple, easy to select ponds. The big drawback here is that confounding variables may greatly increase the variation, reducing the uh, power of your test and your ability to determine whether in fact fish have an impact on tadpole survival. Well, as we talked about, one way of reducing this kind of extraneous variation is to use uh, a blocked or paired experimental design. In the paired design, you might choose pairs of ponds that are similar in all respects except the presence of fish. Um, in a blocked design, you might block on aspect, presence of tiger salamanders, elevation, water temperature or quality, and again, randomly select ponds with the presence of absence of fish um, in each block at high and low elevations, for instance. Uh, pros is that this would reduce the uh, variation and allow you to test your uh, hypothesis of interest more precisely. The big drawbacks are becomes much more dif difficult to select ponds. Um, sample size may be needing to be much larger. Uh, depending on the number of blocking factors that you're including. And it may be logistically impossible, say, to use a pair design. You may just not be able to find two ponds close together, one with fish and one without, because fish tend to move from one pond to another. So um, that could um, make for some severe logistical limitations. Another um, solution to this problem of confounding variables would be using analysis of covariance and just randomly go out and choose ponds uh, and with and without fish and measure key covariates in each one. Uh, the pros like we talked about is it makes it much easier to select your ponds. The drawback is that um, 
Depending on how you select those ponds, you may not get the range of covariates that you needed, either elevation or presence, absence of salamanders, water quality, and so on. Um, another drawback is that now you need to sample for each one of those covariates in each pond, which could take a lot of time and uh, resources. And you now have to know ahead of time which are the important covariates to measure so that you can factor out these uh, sources of variation. You could also use the other types of approaches that we've talked about, the backy design, um, where now fish are either added to or removed from ponds. You measure survival of tadpoles before and after this treatment had been applied and you do that in multiple ponds. Um, in many cases, it's difficult to get permission in this uh, photograph here. This is an example of someone spraying rotenone on a pond to remove fish. Uh, there's a lot of public resistance to this sort of thing. You're applying a very toxic chemical out in the environment and oftentimes uh, there's pushback on that. Um, could use a response gradient type of approach where you measure, say, fish density in each pond and model the relationship between tadpole survival and fish density. Uh, now you're adding a whole nother uh, variable that you have to measure, uh, fish density. And that can be time intensive and expensive, so that could re result in reduced sample size. As we talked over, talked about, you could use a crossover design. So if you are given an okay to do these treatments um, in a limited number of ponds, you might uh, add fish to the ponds, look at the effects uh, in one year, and then remove fish and assign them to another, the other ponds that didn't have fish and measure that in the following year. Again, logistically, this becomes pretty difficult. Um, or another approach would be to say, let's not try to do this in natural ponds at all, but to bring um, tadpoles into um, a more controlled environment like mesocoms where you have, say, bathtub sized um, tubs where you put fish in and don't have fish and um, look at the effects on survival of your tadpoles. Of course, you have the question of how well does that apply to the natural world. Um, nice thing about this is that you could then start to include some of these other covariates that you think are important, presence or absence of tiger salamanders and so on. Um, of course, this becomes, um, again, uh, logistically difficult. You have to have the area where you can put out these mesocoms. You got to purchase and maintain the mesocoms. Um, and in this case, you've got a endangered species in Colorado in captivity that adds a whole nother level of logistical uh, consideration. So uh, all of these have pros, all of them have drawbacks. It's really just a question of uh, what's logistically feasible and what uh, based on your knowledge of the system is going to give you the best uh, bang for your buck. So just finishing up this whole uh, review of experimental design, uh, the important thing is there's many ways to examine the same question. There's no single best approach. Uh, having a good understanding of the system um, will lead to better design, so due diligence uh, going back and looking at the literature, seeing what people have done before, identifying what uh, confounding factors might be out there that you need to control for and so on. Um, also transparent methodology, so making it exactly clear how you selected your ponds, uh, how the treatments were applied, how you measured uh, tadpole survival. All of these things are going to be important for helping understanding the relevance of the results when you're done. Um, the other thing is that multiple approaches can be revealing. So uh, mesocom studies may be able to tell you intricacies of these interactions that you wouldn't be able to study in 
uh, large natural ponds. But on the other hand, as we've talked about, those mesocoms may have some limitations in how well you can apply what you see in those mesocoms to natural environments where you have the presence of logs and uh, other types of vegetation that might reduce predation on some of these tadpoles. Um, and then one important thing I want to add here is um, to make adjustments if warranted. Take a look at section 3.20 of the text where they talk about situations where uh, scientists thought they had a great design, went out and applied it and found maybe after the first year, you know, this um, treatment control approach that we were going to use for oiling of beaches in uh, Prince William Sound after the Exxon Valdez uh, spill maybe uh, doesn't work out quite as well as we thought and we need to uh, change things in uh, following years. I think the important thing is to really be open to making adjustments. Oftentimes people think, well, we started it this way, we have to continue so that our results are, comparison, are comparable. Well, if you started with a bad design because of something you hadn't thought about, it's kind of silly to continue using that same design. And you're really, in the long run, going to be much better off by carefully considering what you found in the first year and making adjustments if warranted.